Welcome to Think Tech Global on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Today we're going to cover the post-election status of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Free Trade Partnership. Our special guest is Russell Hanma, APEC Master Plan Author and Attaché for the United States Trade Representative Office. The campaign this year, the presidential campaign, raised the question of whether we, as a country, should continue pursuing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's a free trade agreement within the Asia-Pacific region. Donald Trump, president-elect, has said that he contemplated issuing a notice of withdrawal from the TPP membership. Japan has recently adopted the TPP in the national parliament, and some countries have said that if the U.S. does withdraw from TPP, they will pursue other agreements instead, such as trade, the trade agreement that China is pursuing under the RECEP, that's the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which actually competes with the U.S. Since the U.S. is not a member of RECEP and China is not a member of TPP. So dropping out of TPP could have enormous consequences on trade between the United States and our Asian trade partners. Today, we're going to explore these events and possibilities with our guest, Russell Hanma, and examine the consequences, the ramifications of what Donald Trump has in mind. With due regard to his appointment just today of Rex Tellison as Secretary of State. The stakes are high. We'll also take a look at Trump's replacement, potential replacement, of Michael Forma as U.S. Trade Representative and who he might appoint next, since that will tell us a lot about which direction Trump will pursue in office in January. Now, let's see what Russell has to say. Welcome to the show, Russell Hanma. Yeah, thank you, Jay, for uh, inviting me again. I remember when I attended the show back in March 22nd of this year regarding the Hawaii's place in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, I did speak about my APEC master plan back then and the consequences what uh, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Trade Agreement, might have an impact to it. And I remember I mentioned back then that uh, because of this presidential election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, my sense of direction of uh, the future prospect of our trade agreements that's going to affect us in Hawaii tremendously as well, the Asia-Pacific trade partners that we are engaging right now. So I think the, what the ramification, what Mr. Uh, President-elect Donald Trump said back in when he was uh, elected in uh, November's election, that he said he is willing to withdraw from the membership of the 12 members of the TPP. And that has really... Uh, had a big impact and consequences with our trade uh, partners and our trade negotiator because as you know Jay, we've been negotiating this trade uh, TPP negotiation for the past seven, eight years already. And matter of fact, in, in Hawaii, we have hosted it two times already, one in Big Island and one in Maui. Uh, and got the TPP members to come here for the negotiation meetings. Yeah, we've and been the lead, the lead proponents of this uh, agreement, haven't we? Yes, Jay. I think uh, we show that uh, the Hawaii is capable of uh, hosting these kind of trade uh, delegates in the trade agreement because we want to make Hawaii the place or mm -hmm. hopefully if we can uh, ratify the TPP and make Hawaii the headquarters for the Asia-Pacific region and have a secretary general in Hawaii to oversee the uh, TPP trade agreement. So it has an effect on Hawaii directly? Yes, I think there's uh, roughly the study that we did, uh, I think there's about roughly 400 companies in, in Hawaii uh, who's going to be, who are exporters, who can export their services as well with their products. You know, it's we a get, perfect thing for Hawaii. Exactly. We have our, you know, many hooded water people, we have our coffee, chocolate, uh, some of these, uh, uh, some of the goods and services that we provide here. We can even give a lot of these uh, engineering consultant, uh, tourism as well. Hotel developers can go to uh, help these countries to how to uh, do a successful development and with the international let, partners. Let me unpack some of this with you. So what is, a, what is the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership? I mean, how does a free trade agreement work? How does this one work? I think you got to really look into the export and uh, import and uh, what the TPP does is uh, they're more concerned about taking off the trade tariffs like the U.S. Customs. Like there's a lot of non-tariff and tariff items and uh, there's roughly about 18,000 items like you know from watches, clothes, clothing, automobile parts, 
medical supplies. So you look at what the U.S. Customs has in terms of uh, liquidation uh, when they justify the commodities. Uh, and you got, they, they have a tremendous amount of database with 18,000 items in there, and they, they designate which country is coming from what commodities and what products are being imported from that country, and they have, a, uh, they have to set that database. And how, how serious is a tariff? How, how, what percentage or amount uh, does the importer have to pay on the goods that are imported. Okay, you know, right now in terms of like a bilateral agreement, uh, like country to country, I can set a good example like Japan and United States. Uh, for example, automobiles, I know that we want to protect our, our, our three General Motors, uh, Chrysler as well, for with our three Detroit, mo you know, big three over there. So what they're trying to put is tariffs like on automobile parts, uh, like pickup trucks uh, are like 25% tariffs. So oh, for example, like oh. uh, Toyota, like we have our Tacoma trucks. They're charging them 25% uh, import taxes. They want to make the fair market value so they, they don't want them to compete with the American uh, pickup truck companies. So this, is a tr this would be Trump's way of, of putting American manufacturers at an advantage against Asian importers. Yes, yeah. I think he made a statement like uh, antagonizing China, like because uh, you know they're worried about the dumping law, currency magnification, and all that. So he was saying that they want to put a tariff of forty-five percent. So in other words, anything that we bring in from China, made in China uh, products, so they'll have forty-five percent more compared to their invoice value. Yeah, and that's going to have like uh, so. What it does is. It makes the American products more competable with the China's product. Because, uh, for example, you're, you're selling a product for $2 on this uh, item from China. And for example, it could be slippers or uh, any kind of plastic materials that brought in. And, and you put a 45% tariff on that one, so that would be like, instead of purchasing it for $2, you're going to pay for like $2.90. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. that way, the American similar product can you know, when you get to that from wholesale, from X factory price to wholesale to retail, there's a markup value. So what it does is it sets the retail price equivalent. So that's part of the protectionist so, movement. So let me get the sequence. Under the TPP, what all of these tariffs would be for, forgiven? They would be deleted? Or would they simply be reduced? I think most of uh, it, it goes by case by case, I think. Uh, uh, but within the TPP with the 12 countries, they kind of agree like most like 95% of the items that's going to be brought in is going to be uh, free trade. Free but trade. But they're going to have a phasing out period. Like, for example, agriculture like fruits and beef and poultry and stuff. They don't want to do it right away. They're going to have a phasing out period. I think they're going to in terms of other uh, commodities like automobile, automobile parts, it's not going to happen right away. It's going to mm -hmm. have a phasing out what, period. What period of time is the phasing? I would say out? within about uh, five years they mm -hmm. want to see if they So can. it doesn't do violence to anything. Exactly, exactly. Now, I guess he's interested in this because he wants to uh, make America great again in terms of manufacturing and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. So he wants to try to discourage uh, importing goods from Asia. Uh, and he wants to, um, you know, therefore, um, make American goods more competitive in the American market. But um, I guess the question I put to you is, will that happen? Do you have any thought about whether that will, in fact, happen if we drop out of TPP? I think that it's not going to happen overnight. I think it, what uh, Donald, President-elect Donald Trump is trying to do is, like, he wants to pers persuade, on, instead of having this multilateral kind of trading with a lot of members, like 12 members, or China has this RCEP with uh, 16 members, with 10 members of ASEAN plus six members. And we even have our trade agreement with the European Union on the TTIP, which stands for a Transatlantic Investment uh, Partnership. Uh, so that's going to have an effect on us as well. But I think in terms of importing in, if you look at the history of a trade, you know, ever since the 18th or 19th century, we had trade with Europe, trade with Asia as well. and. If you look at all the investors that we have in the United States, we've got Germany, France, Japan, South Korea, all the European countries. They've been investing in the United States for all these years. So, you know, they already start up factories here. They have their subsidiary companies. They're doing, you know, they're part of our economy already. And, and this uh, goes hand in glove with exactly, their investment. Exactly. And if they want these countries to come and invest again, they can set up the factories here, uh, retool their uh, equipment. 
and create uh, more additional jobs. And I think you're get, you're, you're going to close that window of opportunity if we don't yeah. uh, pursue the TPP. What, one other point before we take our break here is that if the United States, if, if there is no TPP, or we're not a member of the TPP, all kinds of things will flow out of that. But one of them that comes to mind, we can talk about others too, um, is that th that doesn't mean that um, we will have the advantage in selling overseas. Because if I add a 25% tariff on cars, or a 45% or whatever you want, you know, on slippers, <laughs> that means that China and other countries um, will respond accordingly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they will add a 25% or a 45% tariff on stuff we like to sell in China. Mm -hmm. And so it's tit for tat, it's reciprocal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what happens? I think, yeah, I think there will be ways of uh, retaliation maybe if we do give like a 45% tariff <laughs> to China. <laughs> I remember like in the 1980s when we had a trade war kind of similar with Japan. I remember when President Ronald Reagan was the president back then and uh, Yoshiharu Nakasone was a uh, prime minister. And we had so much trade uh, issues with the U.S. and Japan back then. Even it affected Hawaii with all this foreign investment from uh, Japan was buying up golf course, hotel, <laughs> resort developments. That was back in the late 80s. And uh, we learned uh, quite a bit from that. And yeah. they became our, uh, you know, best partners yeah, and, uh, you know, their allies and, you know, and those kind of aspects. So those were good investments, I think. Yeah, and I yeah, hope yeah. that maybe in the future we can have a good relation with China and hopefully we can uh, iron out the differences. And, and part of a good relationship is to go easy on tariffs. Part of a good relationship is to have free trade agreements, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think China was showing an example that they want to be a member of a TPP. Yeah. And all the other countries in the APEC, I know that even India, they're not even a member of APEC. And they're, they're showing us yeah. they want to be a member of APEC and TPP. And Let's take a short break, Russell <laughs> Hanma. Um, and he is the APEC Master Plan author and deals with Trans-Pacific Partnership. We'll be right back for more about that subject. Thank you, Hawaii, Asia in Review. I am Johnson Choi, the host. I'm looking forward to see you next month, December 15, Thursday, 11 o'clock, right here again. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider, and we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock, and we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha. Aloha. I am Reg Baker, and I am the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 in the Think Tech studios in downtown Honolulu. We highlight successful stories about businesses and individuals and learn their secrets to success. I hope you can join us on our next show on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Until then, aloha. We're back. We're live. I'm here with uh, Russell Hanma. Hanma. Um, he's the APAC Master Plan author, and he knows a lot about the Trans-Pacific Partnership in that capacity. And uh, we want to find out more about how this does work or would work. Um, so right now, the U.S. does have some free trade agreements out there, don't we? Don't we have some? Don't oh, we? Oh, yeah. Actually, you know, we, we're kind of generous because we have this uh, trade agreements with this developing nation, the third world countries. And, uh, you know, we're giving them a free trade agreement and a status in that way. Yeah, so, sure. And we help them out. It's a way of giving them aid, I think. Exactly. To and encourage their development. Yeah, even we have one with Africa. Nobody mentions, talks about, they might be the next uh, region that's going to grow after India. And uh, yeah. it's, a, it's called American Growth Opportunity Act, yeah. which is AGOA. So I know there's a lot of uh, uh, trade agreements that we've been initiating. Uh, but I think, you know, President-elect Donald Trump needs to understand what these trade agreements really stand for and uh, what we went through uh, to ratify it or, you know, all the past presidents went through yeah, as well. It's not easy. So because people exactly, do oppose exactly. it on the basis that you're uh, competing or making it mm -hmm. more difficult for them to manufacture in your country. Exactly. And I think the world is changing so fast. And uh, even if third world developing nations are coming up to the same par now and, you know, with the Internet, with the communication and technology enhancement, that uh, everybody's got the same amount of information. So yeah. they're yeah. really, they all want to be 
you know, yeah. they want to they wanna have quality of life in their country and do well and stuff. So. Sure. <sighs> and, but why, why don't we just go to the bottom line and make, a, make the world a free trade agreement? Mm -hmm. Why limit it to Asia and Europe and Africa? Why don't we just say, no more tariff? We love you all. Mm -hmm. we, want, mm -hmm. we want everybody happy together, so you know, we're going to have a free trade agreement that covers every single country on the planet. Right. A, why not this happen? And B, is this ultimately where we're going? I think that's like a utopia kind of thing. It doesn't happen overnight. We've got people like President -elect Donald Trump who's, who wants to protect the United States industry as a, a nationalism kind of concept. So, uh, you know, we have a a leading agency that sits on top is called WTO, World Trade Organization. And uh, they look at the, they're in Brussels in Europe, uh, the headquarters, and they look at the overall of the trade policies. And, uh, you know, there's a dispute settlement where, you know, countries can uh, protest uh, what other countries are doing in terms of harming their industry. And a good example, we had one in the past about the uh, solar panels from China. Mm. And there was a lot of concern because they're uh, selling it below the fair market value in, in terms of anti-dumping law. Yeah. So the Counterville Duty Act. So yeah. they had a grounds to make that argument under WTO. And, How uh, do we do on that? I think uh, you know, Solar Homes or you know some of the other companies in the United States that uh, looked into it and uh, they you know found out that it was justified that there were Dumping law regulation so was applied. With so that mechanism with the WTO, w were we able to stop China from dumping? Oh yeah, definitely. They, they want to be member of the WTO, so they want to make sure that they're in a law-abiding country. <laughs> so because the world is <laughs> looking at them now, so ever since they were part of the, uh, they became a member of the International Monetary Fund, and so you know they're part of the banking system. To world. Be re respectable, right? <laughs> so they can ac actually do the you know currency uh, uh, you know manipulation. So there. then I want to so. So we have this continuum where ultimately, hum, hopefully someday, I know it's not going to be in our lifetime, but someday in the world we'll reach the utopia of free trade everywhere. But we're not there yet. Yeah, I don't think It'll take uh, quite some time. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of special interests, political mm -hmm. and diplomatic considerations and all that. But right now, so we have one with Europe. We have one with Africa or about to be, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, we'd like to do this one with Trans-Pacific Partnership except for Donald Trump. Um, and we have a competing one, I'm just talking about the four corners of our conversation here, that China's trying to set up for its, its interests. <clears throat> what's, the, what's the advantage of doing with one neighborhood and not another? Uh, why 12 members of TPP? Why not 15? Why not 18? Mm -hmm. Why not 36? Mm -hmm. Um, how do you make that decision? Is it a diplomatic issue? Is it a strategic issue? Is it a military issue? Why do we limit it to 12? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Jay, because, uh, you know, when I proposed my, uh, when I drafted my APEC master plan, I drafted in a fashion where I wanted to include all 21 countries. Or uh, APEC, the, sure. Yeah, it should be part of the uh, Bogart doctrines on uh, 1994. Bogart, it states that by year 2020, all APEC countries throughout the Asia Pacific region should have a free trade area in that region. And that's why we're pursuing this TPP to meet the 2020. And our, as well, China is pushing for RCEP, which is uh, trying to meet the requirement of the Bogart Doctrine. So right now- well, What is the Bogart Doctrine? Bogart Doctrine is uh, when the, in, it happened in 1994 in Bogdar, Indonesia, there was an APEC conference. And that's when the world the leaders of the APEC got together and say, all right, we got to have this trade agreement. And uh, by year 2020, we got to have all members to be part of the uh, free trade agreement uh -huh, on developed uh -huh. countries and undeveloped uh -huh, countries. Uh -huh. so, Open-minded. Yeah, exactly. Aggressive. So we still got I guess three more years, uh, you know, to pursue this. Uh, so hopefully, if we're going to meet the requirement. And just recently, uh, this past uh, about a week ago, there was an APEC conference in Peru, mm -hmm. and when the trade ministers and the leaders got together and they said that we don't want to have protectionist movement. We want to have a free trade. We want to continue pursuing the uh, free trade area for Asia Pacific region by year 2020, and hopefully. Uh, the members and they they did in, in the dialogue it came out that they wanted all members of APEC to be part of the TPP. 
And so that's an interesting, yeah, that's scenario, interesting. Yeah, yeah. scenario that came I mean, up. Hopefully it'll get there. Mm -hmm. Let, let's take a moment, though, to, to talk about APEC and why APEC wants to have a master plan, what it is for APEC to have a master plan, how influential, how important is that, and, and your role as, um, you know, a, a trade, working for the trade representative, U.S. trade representative in developing this plan. Can we put that together so we understand? Yeah, I think it, uh, overall, because what APEC does is, it's a pretty much an independent agency. They alternate leaders. Asia Pacific Economic yeah, corporate, corporate. Cooperation. And, with and the headquarters is located in Singapore right now. And they just changed the leadership. Uh, I believe the, ex the Secretary General is uh, uh, a gentleman from New Zealand, one of the trade ministers. Is, is, we consider him as ambassador. Uh, he's a senior official there. So uh, he's supposed to oversee that and hopefully uh, uh, see if we can come up with some kind of uh, regional trade agreements. But, but APEC is so div diversified. It's 21 know, countries. 21 countries. And you were actually contracted with APEC? No, I'm not contracted. I did you the, were contracted with the U.S. Trade Representative? More like uh, I did my master plan, so I'm just, I was a trade delegate on this, uh, when they had the negotiation in 19th round in Bernal, Darsama. And I did a presentation on my APEC master plan as a, a trade delegate from the USTR's mm -hmm, office. Mm -hmm, so that, mm -hmm. that was one of You've my been following us a long time, Russell. Yes, yeah. I've been, uh, so you know, I'm pretty much an advocate and you know, I like to make it work, uh, but you know, I want to make sure that United States and Hawaii benefits from this trade agreement. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know, we're such in the middle of the Pacific here, we're island here, and you know, as you know, we are the gateway of Asia already, and we're the hub of uh, Asia Pacific We have region. to hold on to that. Exactly, exactly, and I think uh, our future uh, for our, uh, you know, our next generation of keikis coming up well as well. If we can maintain uh, our economic growth, we need to get yeah. involved with the international we, trade we and some of the issues. On, on the route, we have to be connected exactly. between the U.S. and Asia. And, you know, not only in that, but I think it helps from tourism as well. Uh, even uh, uh, some of these investments, developments, uh, real estate as well. You know, if you go from a military aspect with uh, U.S. Pacific Command here doing the RIMPAC exercise, we got all the APEC countries to, uh, through the Minister of Defense to participate in Hawaii uh, to bring peace within the so region. So what, what do you say to the manufacturer in the, mid, in the Midwest who's, uh, you know, teeter-tottering because he's in competition with China or, well, some member of that 12, um, and they're, they're you know, selling cheaper in the U.S. What do you say to him, uh, you know, uh, on the question of how, what he can do to survive, mm -hmm. and what do you say to him to sell TPP to him? Um, how can you make him happy? What mm -hmm. would you say? Yeah, I would say, you know, TPP goes both ways, not only for exporting, but it goes for importing, too. If that gentleman on the other side of the fence uh, wants to do business with the United States, not only importing American goods there, we want them to invest in the U.S. soil as well. And hopefully maybe they can set up factories or they can renovate new buildings or start up new sh you know, shopping malls or development or real estate development, you know, in terms of investment. We, and we've seen that happen with Japan, South Korea as well, and Taiwan and, uh, uh, since the 1980s and 90s that uh, mm -hmm. we had that trade war with Japan in the 19 early late 80s and 90 that uh, and Japan said hey man we're gonna start investing in the US soil and they start building factories here with the automobile industry uh, electronics firms are all over you know and, and so and they're off so they're factories you know, in the United States. And, uh, <clears throat> it strikes me that we could do TPP but we would have to uh, step up to new technology because mm -hmm. our labor expenses are likely to be higher in, against some countries in, in the 12 or mm -hmm. in Asia. Um, but if we got really smart about the technology and rebuilt our factories and became the best in the world in terms of efficiency of factory production, um, then we'd have no problem being part of mm -hmm. TPP. And we'd do swell that way, wouldn't we? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you've got to look at two ways. Jay, if you're going to have an efficient uh, manufacturing production in the factory automation, because uh, instead of using manual labor, you've got to use uh, robotics or machinery exactly. to do the 
a continuous production, uh, flexible machine system kind of operation. So uh, that might take less jobs in terms of white collar, I mean the blue collar job industry with the union yeah. workers. So that's another concern too, you know, if you, if you bring up a high tech. But with Donald Trump's elected, he's got to realize the working force with the labor. You know, I, I don't mind seeing some of these uh, industrial products like we have our, uh, you know, we have a stronghold for industrial, like washing machine, uh, dryers, some of these uh, kitchen uh, kind of uh, appliances. Yeah. I think we're world leaders. If we can manufacture that in the U.S. and uh, even, you know, air conditioned mm -hmm. units, uh, anything that's heavy industry products. So to conclude, stronghold for Russell, that one. to conclude, Donald Trump has, has made some real threats on TPP, and it, it sounds like, uh, you know, uh, he's going to try to stop U.S. membership in TPP. So uh, there's, there's camera one over there. Could you mm -hmm. please talk to Donald Trump and see if you can change his mind? You have one minute to do this, okay? Okay, this message is to President-elect Donald Trump. Congratulations for your, your presidency election. I know there's a lot of controversy right now going through with your, election, your selection of your cabinet members. But, and my concern is like uh, what the ambassadors from the other countries are, are trying to persuade you as well. I know there's ambassadors, Mirapuni from Singapore as well, ambassador from Australia, Joe Hockey, has uh, brought it up to, to your staff with your uh, transition team that TP to reconsider uh, uh, ratified in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I think in, in the long term, if you realize the consequence, we can make it work because uh, TPP is going to be changing anyway. You know, if you set the terms and condition of the TPP, the members going to eventually see they're going to meet periodically, and as well, there's 12 members right now. We want to include other members in the APEC. Uh, so it's not country. static. Yeah, right. It's so it's not the terms of the members. This mm -hmm. is this is a dynamic uh, arrangement. A, a TPP is not static. I think it's an important point. I hope he listens to you, yeah. Russell. And hopefully, hopefully, we can make the United States or Hawaii the headquarters for TPP. Yeah. And uh, that's going to bring us a tremendous amount of competitive edge to us yeah. in the uh, U.S. Uh, creating jobs and uh, made in USA products. Thank you, Russell. That's Russell uh, Hanma. He's the APEC master plan author, part of the uh, office of the U.S. trade representative. We've been talking about TPP. We've been talking about Donald Trump's uh, in, uh, in the inclinations on it, and uh, maybe he should reconsider what he has said so far. Uh, thank you to our staff here, uh, Zuri Bender, our senior production manager. Uh, thank you to uh, Robert McLean, our floor manager. This is Think Tech broadcasting every hour on, on the hour with things that you need to know about Hawaii and the world. Thanks for watching, and thank you, Russell. Thank you. Oh, thank wow. you, Jay.